Hello, and welcome back to the Lambda Bible Studies. Um, and as my guest today, Simon Gathercole. How are you doing, Simon? Good to see you, Luke. Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yes, and um, you've just recently published this book, yeah. um, the, the Apocryphal Gospels. Um, so why don't you quickly give us uh, an introduction to yourself? Who, who are you and what is this book? Sure. Uh, well, I'm Simon Gathercom. I'm professor of New Testament and early Christianity here in Cambridge, where I where I am and where Luke is. Uh, and um, uh, I mainly work on uh, gospels, but I also um, do research into the Apostle Paul sometimes. Um, uh, but yeah, the main focus of my work in the last few years has been the apocryphal gospels, that is gospels which are not sort of part of the Christian canon, so not Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Uh, and, and the book is really a translation of some of the uh, best sort of best known apocryphal gospels. Um, and that ranges from um, some gospels which are which cover Jesus, um, Jesus childhood, um, uh, some gospels which uh, have sayings of Jesus which uh, are not sort of historical, you know, which are not historical. You know, the, these apocryphal gospels are uh, a sort of legendary text, um, but also um, accounts of Jesus' trial before um, before Pontius Pilate, for example, um, and uh, as well as dialogues that Jesus is purported to have had with, um, you know, after his resurrection. Uh, as well as sort of more sermon-like uh, descriptions of what Jesus got up to. Um, so it, it covers a range of different sorts of apocryphal gospel texts. So how come these gospels didn't make it into the canon? What, was this some um, plot or contrivance to, to down-select the truth and from a, from a vast range of sources? How, how did this happen? Well, I think there, there are a number of factors that uh, influence the the, um, the the sort of growing popularity of the canonical gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John uh, and they seem to be the the, the gospels that are most used um, really from very early on in the second century um, and as these uh, as these new, new testament gospels became more and more popular um, other groups started to produce uh, in some cases rival texts um, and in some cases, um, more sort of supplementary texts. So the apocryphal gospels sort of fall, you know, very crudely into sort of two groups. Um, some like the Gospel of Thomas, which um, which seek to sort of undermine the canonical gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and produce uh, a, an alternative Jesus in their place. Um, other texts are not intended to sort of undermine the uh, canonical gospels, but are more um a sort of pious legends i suppose uh so the the gospel of the infancy gospel which um tells stories about G what jesus got up to when he was five and when he was eight and when he was 12 um that 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 was never intended as a book um to be included in the canon but it was intended as a kind of supplement um, to the canonical gospels which of course don't say anything about um, Jesus' childhood between the age of about one and twelve. Cringe Walker in chat is saying, make sure to mention some texts like the Acts of the Apostles, which aren't actually gospels per se, but have some some gospel like qualities. And he says, Acts of Thomas equals curiosity. Gospel of Thomas yeah. equals trash. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree with this assessment? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. The Acts of Thomas are. Um, are actually an interesting text because there are there are earliest source for um, for the, for the for the idea that Jesus that Jesus sent the apostle um, Thomas to India or or that um, the Gospel of Thomas went to India and and if you talk to Indian Christians today, um, al almost all of them uh, assume that Saint Thomas brought the good news to India, um, and uh, there are still churches called the, you know. Um, there are people who call themselves Thomas Christians in India um, uh -huh. and the Acts of Thomas which dates to around AD 200 um, may well preserve a kind of historical um, uh, memory of, of Thomas having gone to India but it's quite it's quite a late source you know but it, you know if you think Thomas if, if he went to India he must have gone in about 40 or 50 AD um, and um, uh, but it's not until quite a lot later that we actually hear that um, 
Uh, right. Do the, do the Indians, do, do, are there some of those church groups that hold the gospel of Thomas with some reverence or, or even those understand that there are um, differences in the level of seriousness you could, with which you can read um, the canonical gospels versus this one text that they particularly hold dear? Oh well, it, well, it's not. It's not the Gospel of Thomas which talks about um, the Jesus. Acts of Thomas is the, the Acts. Yeah. So okay. So, um, no, I mean, the the Acts of Thomas are um, are not are not sort of um, really used by any sorts of Christians, as far as I know. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But um, no, it's merely merely that um, you know, as a lot of these apocryphal bit of history. Yeah, the, the, uh, these apocryphal texts do sort of shed light, not on not on Jesus per se, but on how Jesus was understood later, um, and and uh, yeah, what the and also what the apostles are, are are thought to have done later. Yeah, there's this rather charming quote from Irenaeus in Against Heresies that that talks about it's not possible there could be more or less than four gospels, mm. just as there is four quarters of the earth. Mm. Uh, in which we live and four universal winds mm. um such there has to be four four gospels mm. um is he reflecting a consensus of his time or was he pushing back against people who wanted to to differ and bring bring other gospels in i think both so i think i think i think there is a, a large um body of christians that you know the mainstream church who who already used um the four gospels because otherwise our Irenaeus is uh, you know Irenaeus isn't re really making an argument for why there are four gospels when referring to the you know it wouldn't be a very effective sort of, uh, as right. an argument but he's, <laughs> he's, he's making an anal a sort of cosmological analogy if you like um but um and and Irenaeus is reflecting the sort of the majority view of mainstream Christians who did hold to um a fourfold gospel uh collection um, but um, it, it is notable that he, he says that there are neither more nor less than four because there are other um, sort of more heretical groups, um, some of whom had more than four and some of whom had fewer than four. So, for example, Marcion, who was one of the uh, leading sort of uh, um, heretics of the second century uh, and who had quite a few followers, uh, Marcion produced his own version of the gospel, uh, which was very much like what our Luke's gospel in the New Testament, but with significant amounts of Luke's gospel chopped out. So, for example, it doesn't have uh, Luke, Luke 1 and 2. Uh, Marcion considered, con, con, Marcion basically went, as he did, as he did with the, the, the letters of Paul, Marcion went through the gospel of Luke um, removing parts which he thought were theologically incorrect hmm. uh, and in particular references to Jesus fulfilling scripture uh, and Jesus judging uh, the world so um, uh, he, he went through both Luke's gospel and um, and the letters of Paul removing parts which he thought were uh, theologically dubious so 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 Marcion ended up with just one gospel text on the other hand there's a there's a, a second century um, sect called the Valentinians who were a sort of uh, who were strongly influenced by Christianity um, and they produced they they accepted the four gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John but they also produced additional gospels like the gospel of truth and the and the gospel of Philip so the Valentinians are, are at the opposite extreme from Marcy and they thought that there were there were there, you know one could use more than four um, gospels rather than less than four or the four themselves what what was the Valentinian the theological project about? What what did they push? What, why were they, why were they um, differing from what we consider orthodoxy now? They had a lot of they, they had a lot in common with with orthodoxy in some ways, um, but they were also strongly influenced by by Platonic philosophy, um, the philosophy of Plato, which was still um, a, a strong movement in the first and second centuries. Um, and so just as just as we commonly find uh, variant forms of Christianity in, in, you know, all down the ages and across the world, we, we, all, we often find forms of Christianity which merge elements of Christianity with the sort of the, the popular, a popular worldview. 
Um, mm. Valentinians merged Christianity with um, Platonist philosophy. And so they had quite a negative view of, uh, of matter. They didn't have a totally negative view of the material world. Um, mm. they, they, they did think that the material world had been created by an inferior god, um, not, the, um, not the supreme god. Um, the, inferior, the, the material world was made by an inferior god who, um, who, who really created an illusory uh, um, realm, hmm. which was both temporary and um, which didn't really reflect the, the true nature of things. Um, and so the, to some extent, the, the world that we live in was not, you know, didn't become corrupted after a fall, but actually was created um, in a corrupted form in, from the beginning because the inferior deity who made it was not able to make a, a sort of proper world. It seems like in this remarkable event of the, the meeting of of deity and matter that it threw up all sorts of interesting questions that people were kind of grappling with. I know the the Gnostics was another group that was around mm. in a similar time period, and and they had I, I think an, an even more negative view towards the the physical. Um, how, how would you characterize the Gnostic take, and, and how did they interact? Yeah. yeah so I, so so as I as I say, the Valentinians took the view that the world was corrupted, but not completely. Uh, evil. Uh, they didn't have a totally evil conception of matter, um, but it, it's, it, it's illusory rather than evil. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the Gnostics did take the view that matter was evil because it was created again not by not by the perfect God you know, who, who, according to Judaism and Christianity, created the world, um, but also not just like the Valentinian creator who was um, not evil but misguided. Um, for the for the Gnostics, the creator was evil, and and so the creator the the, the creation that he made um, was was also evil. So some in some Gnostic gospels, like the Gospel of the Egyptians or the Gospel of Judas, um, you get these gruesome descriptions of the, uh, the the demonic powers which make the world. Um, uh, in in contrast to the Valentinians, who who, who in in the Gospel of Philip, for example. Um, talk about how um, it's an ignorant demiurge, um, an, an ignorant um, creator god who who makes the world. So would, you, would you label some of the Gospels and some of these texts as having been created by either the Valentinian or the, mm. um, the Gnostic groups uh, as a way to... Um, do, do, do you think the people writing these texts believed what they were recording if if they had genuine belief in what they were saying they must have thought that these texts were i i'm wondering if they were writing down things that they they, they weren't fabricating it unless they were um in, inventing things and knew that it was mm. fake right so how did these how do you think these texts came about well i think i think in some ways they were they were probably sincerely writing things which reflected their own beliefs um and um, so, and, and yes, it's absolutely right that the that some of these apocryphal gospels uh, um, can be assigned to particular groups. So, um, the Valentinians, uh, whom I mentioned, who 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 believed in this sort of uh, inferior but not evil deity, um, they they wrote um, uh, the Gospel of Truth and the Gospel of Philip, and so those two texts reflect that their theology. Um, whereas the Gospel of the Egyptians uh, and the Gospel of Judas uh, reflect the sort of Gnostic uh, theology of um, of an evil creator and an evil deity. Obviously, it's quite it's quite hard to know what what was going through their mind, you know, by, you know as is all the, was the case with sort of people too. Yeah, fast. it's hard to know. It's quite exactly quite speculative, but I, I'm imagining maybe they had an oral tradition within their mm. group, and they believed that certain events had happened M maybe they in recalling things in, in recalling events from the life of jesus um their memory shifted towards jesus having said things that lined up with their mm -hmm. beliefs something like that and then they they end up scri scribing oh we haven't got a written copy of this event let's put it in our new text yeah. we're working on Some, something like this yeah that's right and 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 for the valentinians who who did accept the uh, the four New Testament Gospels? 
um, they often in interpreted the Gospels allegorically. That is to say that the, mm. events, the events that Jesus um, um, participated in, 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 you know, in his in his ministry in the 30s AD um, were not, were, were, you know, could be understood literally, but more important was the the allegorical um, meaning. So, uh, so for example, when when Jesus in in Mark um, Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter five, um, heals if um, in 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 on the same day a a woman who has had a flow of blood for twelve years and uh, a girl who was twelve years old. Um, they see great significance in the number twelve here. Mm. Um, and um, because they had this, the Valentinians had this conception of 12 heavenly realms, okay, uh, which they called eons. Um, so 12 heavenly realms. And it was the, the, the last one of these, uh, the 12th, that, that fell um, and caused, uh, ah. caused a kind of cosmic fall. And so uh, um, in the Valentinian theology, when Jesus heals the, 12 year old girl and the woman who's had a flow of blood for 12 years jesus is restoring the cosmos the 12th eon restoring the 12th eon uh, um, uh -huh. and sort of healing the 12th eon and so bringing the the true uh heavenly um uh realms to back to their sort of perfect completion hmm. you, you mentioned um platonic thought so mm. how how much is uh, what's going on? A reconciling of the Jewish tradition with Greek thinking. Yeah, I think so. So for um, for someone like Plato, um, especially if you if you read uh, his dialogue, uh, a dialogue like the the Phaedo. The Phaedo is um, uh, a dialogue which centres on on Socrates's very last days before he dies, um, and it's a dialogue about the immortality of the soul. And hmm. uh, Socrates is 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 being consoled uh, about his imminent death by his um, by the fact that you know his soul is immortal, and so whatever happens to his body um, doesn't matter. And his friends come along and say, you know, Socrates, how do you, how do you want us to bury you? What sort of arrangements do you want to make? And uh, Socrates said, Oh, don't don't fuss about my burial. That's not, if you if you bury the body, that won't be me. Um, it's my soul which um, which endures, um, hmm. my soul which is immortal, um, and so when that when that sort of when that idea of an immortal soul and an irrelevant body um, uh, becomes prominent, um, not not even just an irrelevant body, for for even even in um, Plato, Plato can describe the um, the body as a sort of fetter, as a sort of chain around the soul. Hmm. Um, and the soul is in many ways better off without it um so so when that when that idea sort of uh, gets combined with christianity um you 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 get a sort of uh, uh, you, you have to sort of well if if these two worldviews encounter one another either you reject the platonist view or you have to change the, your christian doctrine of creation hmm. um, because in 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 christianity uh, as inherited from 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 Judaism, um, it's the perfect God who creates the world, uh, and and the world reflects, at least in its initial uh, form before the fall, uh, that God creates in Genesis one, and He saw that it was good, uh, and each in, on each day where you have the um, uh, the events of creation, God create creates something and it is good, uh, and so and so if if that sort of Christian doctrine of creation comes into comes into contact with uh, the Platonic idea that the material world is is bad or at least um, corrupt in some way. Um, then something something's got to give. You can either um, compromise on the on the Christian side, or you can compromise on the Platonist side. Mm, and people were fond of their Platonic thinking. Um... I, I, it makes me think of um, in Mark 12, where there's that discussion of the Sadducees saying there's no resurrection mm. at all. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't have a clear idea of what Jewish thinking pre pre Christ was about. How, how clear were they about what happened after you died, and um, whether whether there was a judgment of, of some sort? Um, mm. I guess a lot of things 
did become clarified a lot of mysteries were unlocked specifically through through jesus yeah um, but the, the, this was it seems like there was significant groups who didn't even believe in any sort of resurrection at, at the time mm. yeah there was there was dispute amongst amongst jews about about the doctrine of the resurrection so um and, and actually you can see in the book of acts that there's dispute between the pharisees who did believe in a resurrection um uh, the resurrection of of the righteous in a bodily form at, um, at the end of time at the last judgment and the sadducees who who didn't believe in any kind of um, bodily resurrection but rather believe that you lived on through your descendants um and um and at the same time there are um there are theologian jewish theologians like philo who's who's writing around the same time as um as jesus jesus is active and about the same time that paul is writing his letters um um a sort of jewish philosopher really philo he he believed he he was very influenced by plato and he took the view that the soul it was the soul which was immortal hmm uh jan's references a recent conversation which i i was actually watching just recently of uh between bishop baron and um jordan peterson and bishop baron mentioned that the created world was very good but not perfect um, I guess he was referencing God in Genesis saying, you know, what he's created is very good. And then the fall happens. Um, so is, is there a sense where the, um, the, the fact that creation is fallen and is depraved through sin is, is a point of meeting where we can say that there is something about physical matter, which is, uh, is is there a, is there a way in which s spiritual, for, for example, Paul um, makes the distinction between fleshly mm -hmm. and uh, and, uh, and the the nature which will survive beyond his body. So there there is this tension, isn't there? Um, in in some sense, that the um, the body that we live in has some connection to the fact that we are still sinful and impure and and that it's releasing the body that allows us to then uh, attain full purification and uh, so uh, the, the, I, I, how, do, how do you think about these ideas well, yeah I don't, I don't think it's the fact that we're bodily per se that um mm -hmm. that makes us sinful because not you know after all jesus jesus had a perfectly human body um mm. and so he wasn't he he he, he wasn't led into sin um sort of automatically by being in a bodily in a bodily situation um but 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 um um paul um does use the phrase flesh and flesh phrase like words like flesh and fleshly to to indicate the fact that we have we do have a sort of sinful nature um which um is is often tied up with our physical desires and the fact that we don't you know we're often tempted through our physical desires, um, mm. so, so um, I think in terms of in terms of actual creation, uh, it's sin that sin comes into the world from outside, as it were. So it's not that the creation is is it, it you know contains sin within it. Although in giving human beings a certain kind of freedom, uh, God did. Um, uh, create human beings in which they had a capacity to uh, sin, even if they weren't created sinful uh, mm. as, a, as a kind of automatic um, response. M much is made in church history of finding heresies and casting them out and in <laughs> making long lists of truths that you have to declare and mm. think, you know, I, I'm sure a, a lot of this does represent real progress in thinking over the years, and you can build build on, you know, stand on the shoulders of of giants. Um, but I, I wonder how much of this um, quite subtle metaphysics is necessary understanding for salvation. Can you mm. be wrong on some of these issues, um, but still have a saving faith? Mm. Yeah, so so I mean, in the New Testament, um, the the gospel is often summarised in very short, um, pithy uh, formulas, like in one Corinthians fifteen, where 
um, Paul is talking about what he what he heard himself uh, as the good news and what he passed on to the Corinthians when he founded their church. And he summarizes it, summarizes it in very short form, like um, uh, that Christ died for our sins, uh, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then appeared. Um, so the, the gospel events are um, are very very simple to grasp. Um, that we that we are uh, we are sinners, but Christ has died for our sins, um, and uh, uh, that Christ re- rose again to bring new life um, to def- to defeat death. So in sen- in a sense, the gospel truths are. Um, are quite straightforward, and um, but uh, but but the Bible talks about other things which are, um, I suppose, the overarching framework for uh, those gospel events, and that and that um, I suppose if you take if you take the view that um, creation is is made sort of already um, sinful, then in a sense uh, human beings aren't. As responsible for for sinning as they as, as they might be, and so um, hmm. that has implications for what it means for Christ to die for our sins. In what sense are they really our sins if 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 we're made sinful? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, um, in what in what sense do we need to to use the lang- to move more sort of the language of Jesus? Um, in what sense can we can we repent if 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 uh, we're not as responsible for our sins and uh it will since we would we be able to um so uh i think some of the um uh the sort of surrounding the doctrine which surrounds the gospel rather than necessarily being a part of the gospel i mean it's not often that the doctrine of creation itself is thought of as part of the gospel but it's part of the substructure of the gospel which um it enables the gospel to make sense and if you sort of tamper with it then it can have implications for how uh, elements of you know the key elements of the gospels are understood mm. in 1 corinthians 15 paul says if christ has not been raised then our preaching is useless <laughs> mm. um, yeah, yeah. I, I just wonder how, how, how many things that that fall into that category uh, i guess it's the difference maybe, maybe there's a, a difference between things which have to be true if you are a theologian and you look into it and you say okay this statement sure. yeah. must yeah. be true versus statements which you have to actively understand and affirm mm. um, you, you could be mistaken on something if you're just a a, a member of the congregation mm. um, maybe there's a higher standard for for a teacher as well that mm. if you're going yeah. to be preaching then there's a a, a more uh, lengthy list of things that we ought to expect you to to understand and, and teach correctly. Yeah, I, I think um, um, you know, I, I think I think children can can eat, can perfectly easily be um, Christians from, from you know from very at a very young age um, yeah. because the un- understanding the um, the key elements of the gospel is not difficult, but they may have all sorts of confused ideas about um, about what. <laughs> what creation is and what resurrection is um yeah so, so, so it has to be, it has to be said cambridge children sometimes ask <laughs> very sophisticated questions <laughs> um there's a question in chat wasn't the gospel of thomas only found in the 20th century are we sure it isn't simply a modern fabrication mm. so maybe that brings us on to the question of of manuscripts and mm. the providence of of, of these gospels yeah, there, there, there are there are some texts um, which are modern fabrications. Um, I think with the Gospel of Thomas, we can be pretty sure it's not a modern fabrication um, because uh, we've we've got four manuscripts of the Gospel of Thomas. Three of them were um, were discovered at the end, actually at the end of the nineteenth century, um, and um, r- right at the very end of the of the of the nineteenth century, and um, we have. We we know who dug them up, and we know the people who you know, Grenfell and Hunt were the people who, um, who supervised the digging team. You know, two Oxford dons, um, and 
Uh, well, that's this... that's surely um, yeah. a good <laughs> surely question. <laughs> yeah. So so and they're written they're written um, uh, in the same style as the thousands of other manuscripts which were discovered from uh, from the same site in Oxyrhynchus, as it's called in Egypt. Um, and so um, you, you know to forge <laughs> you know the hundred thousand or so manuscripts uh, that come from that site would have been impossible. Um, and so we can be pretty sure that those three fragments of the Gospel of Thomas are um, are, are real ancient texts. Um, and then in the 1940s, uh, the discovery was made of the Coptic text of the Gospel of Thomas, which is a um, Coptic being a, an Egyptian language. Um, and that's a complete text of the Gospel, which survives with, um, uh, with dozens of other um, uh, Coptic works in a collection of um, ancient codices or books um, and and again um, to, to forge that kind of manuscript to to get hold of I mean because some some of these texts of course have been carbon dated uh, mm. not not so not in terms of the, um, uh, uh, well, well, the you know you take a bit of the papyrus and you um, you carbon date it which we can talk about later if you if, if you like the the handwriting uh, the analysis of the handwriting is 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 a, a, um, a fairly inexact science, but it's it has some reliability, and it's very difficult to uh, to forge you know vast swathes of manuscripts like we have uh, in and around the Gospel of Thomas. Um, mm. Even some some texts have even had their ink analysed. Um, mm. So so um, uh, because we know and we know from that what. Uh, um, how the ancients made their ink. Um, so I think in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, there, there's, a, there's, there's a distinction between it being a genuinely ancient text, which it is, uh, versus a, it being a genuine historical doc document in the sense of really being written by Thomas and really describing uh, what, Jesus, what Jesus did and said, which it certainly isn't. Right. Yeah, I, th I think um, po pondering these kind of questions is actually a useful exercise for mm. um, people who aren't involved in historical scholarship because you often find people with quite um, a surprising degree of skepticism mm. about the canonical gospels mm. uh, and I think the um, the level of conspiracy that would be necessary for them to be totally um, fabric, you know, to, if, if you imagine that it's possible to create and um, bury all of these fake manuscripts, mm. say, 800 years after the supposed date, the yeah. the amount of people who would have to be in on the, because you talk about like te testing the ink. So are the people who are doing the ink testing now also in on the conspiracy <laughs> or did the people who fabricate it know in advance that the ink was going to be analyzed so they thought ahead and uh, you know made up the correct type of yeah, fake ink yeah 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 i mean it's, yeah if, i mean if you look if you look in um in in the the book i, I i've written the, the, i think the gospel of judas and the gospel of jesus wife are two mm -hmm. sort of interesting cases because um, the Gospel of Jesus' wife came to light in 2006 and the Gospel of Jesus' wife, sorry, the Gospel of Judas came to light in 2006 and the Gospel of Jesus' wife came to light in, I think, was it 2017 or, or thereabouts. Um, and, um, sorry, no, 2012 it was. Um, right. And um, um, the, Gospel of, the Gospel of Judas was... Um, the text was acquired by National Ge Geographic, which is obviously a massive institution, uh, which had the funding to test the, um, to carbon date the papyrus, uh, to test the ink. Uh, and uh, so, so the Gospel of Judas was, um, you know, not many ancient texts have been carbon dated actually, because it's such an expensive process and it, destro mm. it destroys papyrus in, you know, in the process. Um, uh, so the Gospel of Judas was, genuinely shown to have been a, a manuscript from about the fourth century uh, and it had the ink was consistent with other inks that we um, know were used at the time um, the gospel of Jesus wife was um, was also also went through some of the same tests 
Um, and it seems like the person who produced the Gospel of Jesus Wife did imitate a, an ancient form of, of ink using um, smoke oh. and gall from an oak tree and you know, you know so he didn't just go down to w h smith's and buy some you know <laughs> part, part of that ink. um he you know he made his own ink um that he thought would would be able to fool people if it went through that same kind of testing and he also used ancient genuinely ancient papyrus so he got hold of some oh, interesting um, ancient papyrus um where where so but it, there were there were sort of three main ways in which it was dis the gospel of jesus wife was discovered to be a forgery um one was one the problem was that the papyrus although it was ancient it was from about the seventh or eighth century and hmm. um that was a time when the dialect that the text was written in was no longer in use mm -hmm. so it's written in it's written in the sahidic dialect of coptic and that was no longer being used in the seventh or eighth century. So that was a big clue, actually, that even though the, man, the, the papyrus was ancient, uh, there was something um, pretty fishy going on. The main, the main. Can the main you can you argue that the the Book of Mormon was was written an, with anachronistic language, but genuinely in the twentieth century? Um, perhaps this was an actual. Well, oh no! So you're saying it is a, yeah, okay. So it was certainly not written earlier than the seventh century, but it would be surprising if it was in the seventh century, given it has an older dialect. Yeah, yeah. And in, in fact, in fact, the main difficulty though with it was that it um, this this little this a tiny little sort of credit card type shape shape size manuscript, uh, and um, the 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 main difficulty was with it was that this Gospel of Jesus wife quotes from the Gospel of Thomas. Um, but it quotes from the Gospel of Thomas in a form uh, which appeared on the internet um, and included a mistake uh, um, <laughs> in, 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 in the, uh, the transcription of the Gospel of Thomas text that, that appeared on the internet. And so um, that was the real source of the Gospel. Of, you know, when it was discovered that the web was the source for the Gospel of Jesus' wife, that was the sort of main nail in the coffin, really. Shouldn't have put the uh, hyperlink in. On the yes, device. exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, what's the what's the time range um, of? So you've in the, in this book, the the apocryphal gospel. Mm. Um, by the way, what what is a good source for for purchasing this book? If my viewers oh, you can buy it. You can buy it on 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 Amazon. Amazon. I know. Perhaps we shouldn't. Um, I don't know whether we should recommend Amazon these days or not. But um, I, yeah, I would. You can, you can get it on Amazon. Um, and, I suppose. Uh, I, I, yes, I suppose. Unless you object to the um, what, what, you know working practices or, or yeah, some, yeah. some other reason not to use it, but it is um, it's kind of the go-to, isn't it? Or eBay. I think you can probably get it on eBay. Um, but yes, it's about and it's about. I think on Amazon at least it's about eight or nine pounds. So it's it's um it's it's not Pen, Penguin are a very good publisher for you know producing their books with good um, uh, with reasonable. Um, Price tags. Price. Yeah. So, so what's the range of uh, of dates that, mm. that are represented? What's the spread? Yeah. Well, well, leaving aside the forgeries of from you know the twentieth and twenty first centuries, um, yeah. the the main range of texts you know start in the second century. So there are quite a few apocryphal gospels already produced um, in the second century. So uh, you know, one hundred and twenty, one hundred and seven, sixty, uh, one hundred and fifty years after Jesus. Um, so the Gospel of Thomas um, and the Gospel of Judas uh, fit into that fit into that uh, bracket, for example. Um, then there are there are sort of later uh, fourth century texts, uh, fifth century texts like the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Gospel of Bartholomew, um, and that's about as far as I go in this book. There there are then of course you know an explosion of medieval legends that appear um, hmm. all the way through the Middle Ages. Um, but um, um, I sort of, uh, in this book, I've included what what tend to be the earliest um, of the apocryphal gospels. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so you have to draw, draw a line somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and particularly in the Middle Ages, there there was a, there's an explosion of literature about Mary, and um, and, huh. uh, and her own birth and how she how she came to give birth to Jesus. Is this in in the wake of the Catholic Church's? Um, particular interest in, in Mary mm. and, and her mother and, and etc. Yeah, and that that actually be began quite early. So already um even in even in the late second century, 
um, we find we find an interest in Mary being born perfect. Um, mm. And there's kind of there's kind of you know logic logic to it in that um, how could Jesus be born? How could Jesus, if Jesus is perfect, be born from an imperfect woman? Well, the solution is oh, Mary must have been perfect as well. Um, of course, then then that sort of has an infinite regress. <laughs> yes, it, it actually does raise the obvious question. It's this like the um I've heard it called the taxi cab fallacy that you kind of take the taxi cab as far as you like and then you you just leave it. Um but of course you're you're already on this road of asking, so how did this person become perfect? Yeah. yeah Surely yeah, they yeah, must have been yeah. born to a perfect parent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th themselves, etc. Um I, I, I wonder if um there's any particular extracts from from texts that that would be worth reading out um it's maybe something related to one of the things we've talked about already um mm. what would you recommend as a as a short ex excerpt um if, if if we were supposed perhaps to um highlight some of the theological um mm. Points well, that we're trying to be made. You've got a copy of the book there um, in yeah. front of you. I think if you if you look if you go to the Gospel of Judas, for example, um, okay. to, to the end of the text, um, mm -hmm. and pa perhaps flip over to the um, the last page, not the very last page, but the page before the last page. There, mm -hmm. um, that's where you have an interesting description of um, well an account really of how Jesus describes his own nature and how Jesus describes what's happening um, in the course of the crucifixion. Is this the destiny of the cosmos or Judas destiny? destiny? Um, Judas, Judas well, destiny. So I think if you, if you, if you read that, that chunk, then there are some yeah. illuminating things there. Great. Let's, let's, let's read it. So um, Judas inquired further, what will become of those who have been baptized in your name? Truly I say to you, replied Jesus, this baptism, uh, my name, not, it will destroy. Are these missing parts of the, of the manuscript fragments that we have? Yeah. yeah. So, so um, this baptism, something, my name, something, not, something, it will destroy the whole generation of the earthly Adam. Tomorrow, the one who carries me about will be tormented. Truly I say to you all, no human mortal hand will sin against me. Truly, I say to you, Judas, those who offer up sacrifices to Seclas, something all since something, everything which is evil, but you will be greater than them all, for you will sacrifice the man who carries me around. Yeah, so already. I think, I think um, so. So if we do, if we leave it out, I mean, what you what you have there is really three statements about the crucifixion, um, two which talk about Jesus, um, about how Judas is going to sacrifice the man who carries me around. So mm. um, on on the sort of classical understanding of Christianity, there's a divine and human nature of Jesus which are united, um, whereas what we have there is. Uh, really a, um, a a spiritual Jesus, the person who's speaking, um, talking about a, a physical body which he really has no no contact with and certainly so you, no union with. Um, mm. So when he talks about the man who carries me about and when he says that no human mortal hand will harm me uh, in the in the crucifixion, he's saying that, that, that it's really a, almost a separate being, well, it is a separate being um, which is going to be crucified on the cross. Um, so Jesus being fully God and fully man in this case is explained by them by a fusion of two beings, uh, a human and a and a God. And the 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 man carries Jesus around in some in some form. Yeah, but it's not really a fusion because because they're sort of they're 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 quite disconnected. Sort of Yoda um, on the back of Luke Skywalker. Yes, exactly. yeah, that's, right. that's a much better analogy. Yeah, that's, I, I like that. That's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And this would have been just the go-to way that the writers probably thought that, that Jesus would have talked about it because that, in their mind that was the, 
the reality. So then, therefore, when they're writing this account, it, it would have felt perfectly natural to yeah to have him talking in this way. Absolutely, because because if you're a Gnostic like the author of the Gospel of Judas is, uh, who and you believe that material that that physical matter is evil, then how could mm -hmm. Jesus possibly have any real contact or real uh, real union or even yeah even contact really with them? Um, uh, he couldn't really have material, you know, proper contact contact with the material world. I, I feel we can't um, we can't do a stream about um, th these texts without finding the passage where um, M Mary is given her route to um, to <laughs> true acceptance. Um, which uh, which gospel is that at the end of? So that's the very last saying of the Gospel of Thomas. Oh, great. Let me find that a second. Uh, 70, page 70. Perhaps you could give a quick... Uh, oh, it's quite short. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll read so it's, it. It's, it's saying 114 in the Gospel of Thomas, yeah. Um, Mary should leave us, Simon Peter said, because women are not worthy of life. Now I will draw her to me and make her male, Jesus said to make her a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself a male will enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> yeah, so, so you get Simon Peter's version initially, which sounds pretty bad. You know, women can't um, can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, but Jesus, of course, you know, says, says no, it's, no, it's quite possible for women to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I'll, ma I'll make them male so they can. You know, <laughs> uh, So it's not, yeah. It's, and that's certainly something which is um, a rather sort of uh, a, a, a rather dubious <laughs> um, <laughs> statement. It's not something that anyone has argued, you know, really goes back to Jesus. It really, ref it really reflects a kind of not 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 a fully Gnostic, but a sort of Gnostic influence in influenced view that um, that the female element, uh, um, you know, both, both spiritually and um, and physically, is sort of deficient in some way. And so um, the, the female spirituality needs to be, um, you know, fully supplemented with um, the, 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 the male component in order to be, um, be fully, uh, um, you know, in, in order to have that sort of spiritual fullness. Um, Ar yeah. Arminius in chat says it's really bizarre. <laughs> now, I, I don't know if this is a, a thing that... Uh, Arminius originally said, or if this is a later <laughs> claimed <laughs> quote from Arminius. <laughs> um, so did these various texts get written and then sit in the ground and have no influence until you, you mentioned mm. recent archaeology? Um, I, I noted, for example, you mentioned that the Quran seems to have had some influence from some of these texts. Mm. So how how did these non-canonical works influence um, thinking for for the centuries to come? Mm. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. As I mentioned, some some of these texts were you know dug up at the end of the nineteenth century or beginning of the twentieth century and uh, had really been lost, you know, properly lost for, for 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 centuries, like the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas. Um, on the other hand, especially the infancy texts, um, the, pro, the, the, the snappily titled Protevangelium of James um, and the infancy gospel, um, those texts were, were actually never really lost. Um, hmm. They were continually copied uh, through the Middle Ages uh, and were translated into Arabic, um, Armenian, Old Slavonic, Georgian, all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful languages and have, have, have really survived down the centuries. The same is true of the Gospel of Nicodemus. Um, and so uh, those texts were, were, nev were, were, were never really lost and they weren't really suppressed as much as the other. Uh, as the were text. the early church fathers quoting them as if they were um, sort of scripture, you know, breathed word of God? No, they 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 did recognise them in a, as in a different category, and indeed some some of the um, early church authors they they don't they really don't like them because they don't like the idea of something being called a called a gospel if it isn't. Mm. Um, but the the um, 
the the proto evangelium of James and the the proto evangelium is a, is an account of really of Mary's birth, and the infancy gospel is an account of Jesus' um, childhood activities, and it's the, uh, the the infancy gospel which has a bit of an influence on the Quran. So the Quran talks about uh, the Quran uh, uh, refers to that um, event in the infancy gospel where um, Jesus makes some clay models of birds and um, breathes life into them and they flutter away. Um, and that, that story comes up in the, in the hmm. uh, Quran. Does um, that mean that the Christians that Muhammad bumped into were quoting this, the Gospel of Thomas frequently? It might, I don't know about frequently, but, but, but it must demonstrate some kind of knowledge of, of mm. what's, 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 what's there. Um, we also find we also find it quite the, the there's quite a popular story in in late antiquity in the Middle Ages about how when the archangel Gabriel visited Mary and um, announced to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus, um, there's a legend that uh, when this happened, Mary was weaving um, a curtain for the temple. And uh, this this first appears in the in the the Proto Evangelium of James, um, and, uh, and and finds its way onto onto um, uh, for example the ceiling of a church in Rome, um, the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, um, just as the 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 story about the clay birds can also um, also appears in um, in some medieval church um, church windows. And you can see a picture of that in the uh, in the book. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll see if I can hold. I find it and hold it up. Um, it's, 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 it, it's in the opening. Opening. Uh, I think it's just before the the first translation bit of translated gospel. So um, here it is. Um, yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Uh, 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 it's a scene in a church in Switzerland. Um, yeah. So um, there was a question that um, Cringe Walker asked. Um, mm. What are your thoughts on the lost sayings of Jesus, phrases found in some apocrypha texts and which show up in early Christian writers but aren't in the Gospels themselves? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, I think probably the most widely quoted uh, or, or, um, saying of Jesus, which doesn't appear in, in the canonical Gospels, is uh, where Jesus says to his disciples, um, it sounds rather a strange thing to say. Be approved money changers. Um, oh, really? <laughs> be, yeah, be, 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 be approved bankers or money changers. And what it what, what it's really referring to is the fact that you, um, the money money changers, of course, were experts. I've never in, heard that for it. That's yeah. Oh well, it's very it's very well known down our way. Um, <laughs> Fair um, of course, money changers are expert in in telling whether a coin is 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 real or counterfeit. Ah. And so what this is what this is really saying is that that Christians need to be um, skilled and wise in detecting what is truth and what is not truth. It would be ironic if that wasn't a saying of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yet, so it's represented something. literally an exhortation to carefully <laughs> think about whether what you're passing on is genuine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, with with some with some sayings of Jesus, I'm sure it's the case that um, a, a, a saying, you know, a, a proverb became popular among Christians, and some people ended up thinking it was said by Jesus because it was mm. so it was so well known, and it was. It's like sort of, putting Einstein on the end of a quote that you find on the internet today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, I think the main difficulty with this, with these sayings is that because they don't really have, they're not really embedded in a historical context, um, like the sayings in the canonical gospels are, it's very, it's, it's, it's basically impossible to know whether they do go back to Jesus or not. Some of them might, right. um, but mm -hmm. we can't really ever have certainty about that. Um, I noted that Irenaeus also quotes from one Clement and the Shepherd of Hermas, which also didn't make canon. So, mm -hmm. how many of these texts are there? I mean, beyond beyond the the Gospels that are not non canonical, how, how many other things? Oh, there know? are. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of 
uh, you know, early Christian texts already from the first from the from the second century, and then obviously mm -hmm. into, into the third century, there there, there are more and more. Um, but obviously, quota quotation um, on its own um, doesn't doesn't really tell you much about what they regarded as as, as scripture. I mean, I quote hundreds of people all the time and and and, and that doesn't mean i sort of think they're the people you right. quote will be disappointed that you don't <laughs> consider them to be inspired in their speech <laughs> um yeah so, so so um um i mean the 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 the, the only real uh proper sort of information that we have about what people regarded as scriptural is when they produce lists of what they regard as canonical texts um, and the, the, the first we, the first one of those we have is from the second century, um, but it, they're the and they're the only real guide to what we what we have. That that's the only real way of knowing what they regarded as as, as scripture and what they didn't. I mean, if we, we can take the example of someone like um, the Jewish historian Josephus, um, and he 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 quotes um, you know dozens and dozens of authors. And he he quotes them as sort of authority. You know, he he makes it sound like they're they're authoritative. So if you just had the quote on its own, you might think, oh, Josephus regards um, whatever it is as canonical. Um, but actually, he uh, you know various points he says there are only twenty four um, um, hmm. Old Testament books, and the, 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 there are twenty four Old Testament books because. Um, well, because, for example, the 12 minor prophets are counted as one because they appear on a single scroll. They, they, they're counted differently from our our 39 Old Testament books, but they're the same books. Yeah, I, I was. I, I thought it might be interesting to talk about the term apocrypha and mm. apocryphal. Um, for example, um, I know that some of our Roman Catholic friends get upset when you refer to the deuterocanonical books as mm. apocryphal because mm. it's developed negative connotations mm. so where does this word come from and where is it appropriate to use well it, the, the word apocry apocryphos is um is a greek word which, which means hidden and so the um uh, the neuter of the, the neuter form of the um the word uh, apocryphon is the um is the singular and the, the plural of apocryphon is apocrypha so that's how we get our term apocrypha um it's a it's the plural of apocryphon and it means um it means hidden books and um and so it's applied yeah in two main contexts today um it, it refers either to the um the books that are sometimes printed as the apocrypha in in bibles today the between the old testament and the new testament often so books like the Wisdom of Solomon and Tobit, and they're conventionally referred to as the Old Testament apocrypha, and books like the the um, the, the Gospels of Thomas and, and Judas and, and the like are usually referred to as the New Testament apocrypha, in other words, Christian apocrypha rather than Jewish apocrypha, um, because the the Old Testament apocrypha are, are basically Jewish texts, um, which are in in turn are in their for their part are useful. Um, sources for Jewish history um, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, and and it it really comes to mean um, a sort of uh, you know dodgy book <laughs> um, because that was that that was the label that was attached to it um, in uh, in various documents by the Church Fathers and um, papal decrees um, where you had had lists of apocryphal uh, 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 list of gospels like the gospel of thomas the gospel of judas and so on and next to them you know apocryphal uh, uh, apocryphal mm. so um um you can you can see in in the book if you look in um in the roman numeral page 20 there's um one of those um one of those papal decrees where you have a list of um non-canonical books and next to each um next to each item in the list uh, you have the word apocryphal mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in, in, in Latin, apocryphum. Yeah. The, the, there's um, reason to be, I think I think there's genuine reason to be concerned and sceptical when there's claims of hidden knowledge, right? If, mm. if somebody yeah. says, 
y- y- yes, you've understood basic line Christianity, but I can give you Christianity plus. Here's 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 what you've you've been missing all of this time. That's right, and that's that that's exactly how some. I mean, um, so in that sense, a text like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas are literally apocryphal because they claim to provide that secret knowledge. So the Gospel of Thomas, um, right at the beginning, starts off. Um, these are the secret sayings hmm. which Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. And similarly, the Gospel of Judas uh, starts off by talking about the secret revelation or the secret judgment that um, that uh, Jesus transmitted to Judas. So I, I remember I remember listening to a, a, a fairly early episode of a podcast called Radio Lab. Um, which had a description of the fact that they um, they found a big rubbish dump of mm. um, ancient snippets and they started piecing them together. And what emerged was this new Jesus who was much more hippie-ish and new age yeah, 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 and, and yeah. Said, said these kind of um, <coughs> quite... quite surprising things and the way mm. this was presented was maybe we've got Jesus wrong yeah, um, yeah so how should we think about these texts mm. I think there's a tendency for some people to be quite well say um there's atheist voices who love to suggest that um Jesus is a, a later fictitious mm. amalgam of the kinds of ideas that were politically useful to the Catholic Church. On the other hand, there's kind of a fear, I think, from a lot of Christians mm. that yeah. these texts are somehow threatening. Um, mm. wh- wh- how, would yeah. you, how would you suggest we should think about all, all That's this? That's a good question. Can I, can I go and get some water, actually? I'll be, I'll Feel be free. right back. <laughs> While you're gone, why don't I read another exciting passage so you can get a taste? I'll pick it random, shall I? Um, this is from, uh, let me see. The uh, I'm just gonna go back until I can find the heading. Um, Mark Marconian's Gospel Jesus raises a dead girl. While Jesus was still speaking, a messenger came from the leader of the synagogue's house. Your daughter has died, the messenger said to Jairus. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Don't be afraid, Jesus said when he heard this. Only believe, and she will be restored. When he came to Jairus' house, Jesus only allowed Peter, John, James and the child's parents in with him. All the others remained outside, lamenting and mourning the girl. Stop crying, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. Knowing that she was dead, they laughed at him. But he took her hand and spoke. Child, get up, he said. Her spirit returned to her, and she immediately stood up. Jesus ordered her to be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but Jesus instructed them not to tell anyone what had happened. Um, that sounds to me very familiar. That sounds almost identical to my memory of the the common account of Jesus raising Jairus' daughter. Um, so, so this was from uh, Marconian's gospel, I think. Uh, is 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 that because he used say the gospel of luke as a source and yes exactly yeah Mar- Mar- marcian produced his text um by by editing edi- editing the gospel of luke um uh-huh. and um um y- yeah so 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 uh just as he did with the, the letters of paul he he takes the best gospel <laughs> <laughs> yeah so 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 he he produced uh, um, in a way, a, 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 a New Testament um, to sort of rival the emerging New Testament, um, but it just consisted of um, of a sort of edited form of Luke's Gospel. Uh, mm. and some of the uh, letters of Paul, interestingly, Marcion's Gospel had Galatians first, um, because for for Marcion, the really important thing was the um, the contrast between the um, the New Testament revelation of Jesus, um, who was a di- who who represented a different God from the Old Testament God, hmm. so he really he really takes to an extreme the 
the contrast in Galatians between law and gospel. Um, so in, 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 in Paul, you, you commonly find this contrast between the law, um, which cannot lead to righteousness, and faith in the gospel, which can lead to righteousness. And Marcion takes that to an extreme in saying that that the God that that Jesus is God and the Old Testament God are um, not only different gods but actually conflicting gods. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. The, there was there was mention in chat of um, of Q, and I, I think while I've got you, I, I have to ask um, your thoughts on um, how should how how can we. How much can we realistically reconstruct about the process that the four canonical authors went mm. through to to make their texts? Yeah, there's 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 quite a lot of controversy about that among among gospel scholars. So the the, the two main theories um, are that um, that Mark's gospel was written first, which is actually a quite widely held view. And that, and that alongside Mark's gospel, there was another text called Q, which is really a collection of sayings. And um, Q contains um, what is um, in both Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. So if we take the Sermon on the Mount, for example, the Sermon on the Mount is not in Mark's gospel, um, but it is in Matthew and in you know, scattered through different places in Luke's gospel, it's in Luke's gospel as well. And so um, Q contains stuff like the Sermon on the Mount. And so, the, the, the you know, the first, ma the one major theory of, of how the gospels came about was that Mark uh, wrote his gospel, um, Q existed around the same time. And so when, Math when Matthew comes along, he uses both Mark and Q. And similarly, Luke, when he comes along, he write, he he bases his gospel on uh, Mark and um, and also includes stuff from Q. So that's the first sort of you know, most uh, most likely theory. The other most likely theory is that um, there wasn't a Q. Um, um, again, Mark came first. So how do you account for the fact that Matthew and Luke have similar stuff? Well, it's because Luke used Matthew as well. Um, as a mm. of, just as Luke mm -hmm. says, you know, I investigated the eyewitness testimonies and um, and and uh, made and made use of those. So Luke, Luke doesn't claim himself to be a, be an eyewitness, but to base his gospel on eyewitness testimony, as he says in the first four verses of his gospel. And it's quite difficult to it's quite difficult to know which of those is is correct. I tend towards the view that uh, there wasn't a cue, but that Luke used Matthew, um, but. I, I I know very intelligent people who take a, take a different view, and and uh, there's no and no consensus among New Testament scholars on that point. Yeah, I, I, maybe this is a a, a, a very um, unfair caricature, but m my impression is that there's quite a lot of skeptical scholarship that goes into trying to pull apart the traditional authorship and and mm -hmm. make the bible appear to be a, a reconstruction of you know all the letters were actually 12 letters and th they weren't by the claimed authors at all and etc uh, to tr try to un undermine the authenticity of the text now I, I don't actually think there would be a problem if there was a certain amount of lost metadata about mm -hmm. what 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 ended up being collected and canonized was was you know got god constructed a set of texts that were sufficient mm. for his purposes uh, and i think we can trust them to be um true we don't have to al also believe th that there are these um truths about the consistency of the texts i don't know but I, so i i don't think I don't think we are required to. Um, we 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 shouldn't feel too concerned. I think, but uh, nonetheless, uh, my observation is uh, I've noticed that the um, the people who consider the texts to be um, God's revealed word also seem to lean towards more straightforward explanations for how they were yeah. 
conceived. I think that's true. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, there's also a slight different. I mean, I suppose there are different sorts of uh, references to authorship of, to the New Testament books as well. So if you take Paul's letters, um, Paul, Paul, Paul's letter, Paul's letters mention the author at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the letters. So uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul, so if Paul, they aren't all written by Paul, Paul's then, name. Is, yeah. So that's some that, questioning of whether that's a true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas, whereas actually, um, if you take the other extreme, the letter to the Hebrews, um, we have no idea who wrote Hebrews. Um, there's no reference to an author um, in the text. There's, there's also not usually reference to the author in in manuscripts of Hebrews. Um, you know, at the beginning or um, or at the end, which is where you often have references to authors. Um, and even already around 200, so not, you know, only a century or so after Hebrews was written, um, we already have four theories about who who wrote Hebrews. You know, was it Barnabas? Was it Luke? Um, was it Paul? Uh, or was it um, a secretary of Paul? Um, so there are these various different, um, you know, it, because Hebrews was anonymous pretty, pretty early on, uh, it generated, you know, yeah, I felt the need to I, find an author for it. I remember hearing a suggest a, a theory that it was anonymous deliberately. That the mm -hmm. um, the the fact that it it the the author wasn't known was quite was kind of a, a deliberate decision. Um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 possible. it's possible. Yeah, but I think I think the the other the other the other kind of authorship that we have is is that of the Gospels, where um, the authors. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John aren't mentioned within the actual text, um, but they were. But because the manuscripts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are so consistent in referring to them as authors, and you know, second-century authors also refer to them as authors of the Gospels, um, there must have been some other way of indicating, you know, at the top of the manuscript or at the bottom of the manuscript, or hmm. um, in a little bookmark which you often get in scrolls. Um, in the ancient world indicating the author um or some other some other form of book technology that they had at the time um, right. there, there were various different ways you know sometimes a cover sheet for example you know there um there are there are lots of different ways in which, which authors can be indicated um so matthew mark and luke and john don't include their names in their gospels but they were probably included um in some other way on the scroll mm. So do you think the um let me phrase the question this way if we didn't have any of these texts at all if if they had either never been written or we'd never found them we had no record of their existence um would that make any practical difference to the life of Christians yeah, if the apocryphal text hadn't, if we didn't know any apocryphal gospels, it's a bit of an easy question. If if the if the actual Bible didn't exist, <laughs> would would there be any? Would that make any difference? <laughs> Maybe some denominations it wouldn't. <laughs> no, I think I think with the apocryphal gospel, I, I think the apocryphal gospels I found useful both as a historian. Um, uh, and as and as you know, in some ways, as a Christian, so as, as a historian, the apocryphal gospels shed quite a lot of light on um, on controversies that were going on about Jesus in the second century, third century, fourth century. Um, so they're, they're they're useful historical sources. Um, I think the way I've I've sort of also found them in doubt, indirectly useful as a as a as a Christian as well. In that, I think when you read a lot of the apocryphal gospels they have a very sort of abstract air to them. So if you read through the Gospel of Thomas, there are hardly any references to geographical places. Um, uh, you know, Israel gets mentioned, um, uh, Samaria gets mentioned, but there are no references to, to towns or rivers or anything like that. Similarly, in the, Gospel of, um, in the Gospel of Philip, you do have a reference to the River Jordan, but you... you, you um, um, you don't really get any reference. You get reference to to the world, <laughs> um, right. and so I think one 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 thing that struck me, having 
spent time working on the apocryphal gospels and going back to the canonical gospels you 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 realize sort of how gritty and earthed the mm. canonical gospels are they have that they have that rich cultural um material that was a part of you know there that that comes about because they emerged from first century um jewish palestine or israel and 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 they reflect that culture um and so the activity and, and teaching of jesus um fits within that jewish culture um if you read the apocryphal gospels they come from a, they they often come from a different sort of a totally different atmosphere um a, a more intellectual atmosphere um and uh and, and so i think it, you know so, terms of thinking about the canonical gospels um the, the the difference that those canonical gospels have from the non-canonical texts um is is um is illuminating um so i think i you know i have i think my understanding of the canonical gospels has actually been sort of enriched uh, indirectly by studying the apocryphal gospels yeah i i find that that's one of those cases especially uh, having grown up in a church and it's, it's almost you, you feel like the bible is the the country in which you live and mm. until you travel abroad you yeah. don't recognize some features of it that are interesting even, even reading things like the quran you you're sort of taken aback by how mm. different it is yeah. but actually the reverse would be the case if you if you'd never encountered the Bible before and then hit it, you, you'd be stunned by how um, how fully fleshed out it is in terms of place and setting and mm. events, yeah. and it feels grounded in yeah. a way that um, w would be difficult in tone to to make up. I think Re mm. yeah. Re realism yeah. in fiction is a very difficult thing to achieve and the sort of um verisimilitude is easily broken yeah. but, but actually also provides genuine um evidence you can go and check do yeah. the names exist exactly. in other sources uh, yeah. does the um i remember pete talking about this i think he was talking about the statistics of you can run you know were these names um consistent with uh the the distribution of names that existed at the time and things like that yeah that's right yeah 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 i mean it just i mean verisimilitude is hard enough to achieve now if you're writing about a different you know in the ancient world you didn't have sort of encyclopedias and uh, oh yes where you can sort of check up check up where you know what was the most popular name in you know <laughs> in <laughs> jerusalem in ad 16. yeah no, i mean no, never mind encyclopedias these days it's easy to forget that um, Google only has existed for yeah, a couple exactly. of decades. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's so easy for us to imagine a process of faking a document that mm. that just isn't isn't conceivable. Um, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, I, I'll. Uh, is it was there any any last parting thoughts? Um, and otherwise, I'll probably pray and we can finish. Um. No, no, but no, no major parting part, parting thoughts. I think, I think. Um, oh, I have put. By the way, um, somebody was in chat was asking for a link because they were interested in in getting a copy. So I put that in the description. So do check the description and um, and yes, it's it, it's it really is very interesting reading both um, Simon your your um, th thoughts and notes around it and and the text themselves. Um, nothing like reading it directly and um and and feeling the the nature of those texts yeah so yeah yeah, yeah and i think that and then go you know then my passing point i suppose would be to go back you know read if you if you read them then go back to the new testament and see how mm -hmm. how how different they 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 uh they, those new testament texts which um you may or may not be familiar with how differently they they feel from those apocryphal gospels johnny the great wrote just arrived well you're late <laughs> you've almost completely missed the stream
but the you late, can now... the, late, the late great John <laughs> the late great Johnny the Great. <laughs> um, does Simon have a favourite oxy rhinsus oxy fragment? Yeah, Ox oxy rhinsus. Um, right. Well, I suppose the ones I the ones I'm most most familiar with. I mean, my, my favourite oxy rhinsus fragment, I suppose, is is um, some fragment or other of the canonical gospels because in that oxy rhinsus rubbish dump. Uh, that, that That's has probably produced what thousands, was hundreds about. of thousands of manuscripts. There are um, not just apocryphal gospels, but there are classical poets um, and and also um, manuscripts of the canonical uh, New Testament as well. So um, um, I don't have a favorite, a, a particular favorite one. Um, the the length that the sort of Dan Brown hypothesized. 8th century Roman council must have gone to to produce the Oxyrhynchus rubbish dump. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Okay, um, well, well thank, thank you very much for joining me, Simon. I'll, Thanks for having me. I'll, I'll pray and then, uh, um, yeah, I recommend people to go and um, hunt out a copy of the book for themselves. So, yeah, let's pray. Um, Lord God, thank you for your words. Thank you for the Gospels that we do have and uh, Thank you for the way they paint such a clear and vivid and accurate um, picture, rich, rich idea of um, Jesus' life and teachings. Um, thank you for the rich archaeological history that, that follows it, um, the way we can trace um, church history. I pray for um, the scholars working on studying it that they could um, help uh, provide a sure foundation for the history and theology of the church. Um, may we, as we um, think about these things, be drawn more into truth and more into wonder and praise of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Great.